Good morning, Antioch. My name is Linda, Linda Van Borst, and I'm the pastor of Children and Family Ministries here at Antioch. Woo, thanks. Um, This fall, we are in a vision series based on our six practices, which you'll find demonstrated by the icons on the walls in our sanctuary. Last week, our lead, pa- our lead pastor, Pete Kelly, introduced our fall vision series, leading us through Psalm 119, and if you missed it, I encourage you to listen to it. This morning, I'm excited to spend our time together considering the first of Antioch's six practices, communion, as illustrated by this icon. But what does communion mean, and why is communion important? as we pursue right relationships with God, self, others, and creation. Communion is an unusual word. I don't use it all that often. And if I do, it's probably in reference to the cracker and the juice that we take to remember what Jesus did for us. But today, we are going to expand on this word, this word, communion. In in regards to this icon, notice the three circles. They are distinct, yet intertwined and connected. This illustrates the idea that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are distinct, yet intertwined and connected in relationship together. So at the very beginning of God's story in Genesis 1, we learn that God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit create all of this and enjoy it with humanity. It was a shared mutual joy. You might imagine humanity intertwined within these circles, distinctly not God, but connected with God in order to enjoy creation. But then people messed it up. And in most relationships, that would be the end of it, but not this one. Instead, God designed a great rescue plan. A savior would rescue creation and redeem the world. So when we look to Jesus as our savior, we're invited back into that relationship, back into communion with God. If we illustrate this with our icons, we would be in the circle which represents Jesus because we are in Christ. Is this feeling a little abstract? Because I understand, and actually so does God. So to help us better grasp this abstract idea, there are a lot of word pictures used throughout the scriptures. So first, wedding language is used to describe this relationship where two become one. Construction language is used, acknowledging that there are many resources used to construct one building. Anatomy language is used, likening people to the many parts of the body with Christ as the head. And gardening language is used illustrating us being grafted into God's own life. This paradigm is different from other ways we might conjure up our idea of God. God is not like Santa Claus giving us what we want. God is not like a genie in a bottle making our wishes come true. And God is not holding a lightning bolt ready to strike us when we mess up. Instead, the way that God has revealed himself to us is in oneness. God is so near that God invites us to himself that we might experience, interact, relate, and respond to each other. That God and humanity might enjoy one another again. So a few weeks ago, my husband and I, we went to the Brandy Carlisle concert at the amphitheater. And this was our first post-COVID concert. And it was so lovely. There were cellos and violins. There was a drum line. The crowd was moving. It was so beautiful. Um, but over these past few years, we had like become really used to virtual experiences, whether that's YouTube live experiences or virtual concerts. And then it hit me. The beauty of this moment was that we were in communion. We were participating together. She was performing and we were enjoying. She was interacting with us and we were responding and we were all enjoying this experience. And here is the mystery of communion. What we can have with each other, we can also have with God. 
This should sound absolutely ridiculous. The God who created this world, the world which was perfect but is now ruined, wants to know us and be known by us. Even though people have seemingly ruined the relationship with God, God does the opposite of what we might expect. God pursues us because, because God wants us to know him and wants to know us. Do you feel like God is pursuing you? If you're looking for the cloud writing in the sky or messages in your alphabet soup, you probably don't feel pursued. But the story of the Bible reminds us that God has interacted with the world, is interacting with the world, and will continue to interact with all of creation for all of eternity. To help us grasp this concept of communion, I invite you to turn to Psalm 33 in your Bible. And as we work through this Psalm, I invite you to consider what this Psalm reveals about our God. Who is this God who has drawn near to us and invites us to become one with him? We'll start in verse one. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. This psalm begins with a reminder to praise God, worship God, sing to God, play instruments in celebration of God. And if you can't sing or play, if you're a little tone deaf like me and you don't know what a 10 string lyre is, the psalmist gives us permission to shout. As the psalm continues, you might imagine it as a love song. This poet has written this love song as an expression of praise to God. I'm not a poet. In fact, I almost died from boredom in my high school poetry class. But even I can recognize that there are some things which can be better communicated through a poem than in an essay. And this love song tells us of reasons why God is deserving of our praise. But before we get to that, I wanna point out that the Hebrew word used here for praise is pronounced yada. Say it with me, yada. This word, this word literally means to revere, to worship, to confess. It's not exactly or necessarily a happy word. Instead, it's a posture of reverence. The word yada reminds us to praise God or to render thanks and confess our trust of God always because of who God is not necessarily because of what God does for us. As I look around this room, I know that some of you don't feel like praising God this morning. In fact, some of you are skeptical if God actually deserves our praise. The heartbreak of life has you wondering if you should really spend today, let alone the rest of your life, praising God and some of you wanna shout God's praises from the mountaintops because you got great news this week. This is us gathering after a very real week of being human. And no matter what this past day, week, month, year has held, this love song begins with a reason to praise God. You'll find it in verse four. The psalmist puts it frankly, we can always praise God because the word of the Lord is right and true. God is faithful in all he does. Underline it, highlight it, draw your attention to these words. Think of these words as an anchor. But if you're skeptical, and this doesn't quite convince you to praise God, you're not alone. 
While the author of this poem is not named, the ancient manuscripts link Psalm 32 and 33 as one, and Psalm 32 is attributed to David, making it very likely that David also wrote this psalm, which becomes really interesting because David had many experiences that we might think would bring him to an abrupt halt and make him stop praising God, let alone sing a love song to God. As a quick reminder, David was hunted by the king. His best friend died in battle. He got caught in an affair and his son died as a young child. These are just a few of the things we might expect to turn a heart of praise to cynicism. And yet here we are reading these words. As we continue, the poet reminds us of four reasons why, no matter what life throws your way, we can praise the Lord. So here's our outline for the rest of the morning. There are four points. If you're a note taker, you can jot them down. First, the psalmist says, praise the Lord because God made me. Then praise the Lord because God holds my life in his hands. Praise the Lord because God sees me. And finally, Praise the Lord because God is my savior. My hope for today is that no matter what season of life you're in, you will be able to confidently trust that God wants to know you and has taken the initiative to be known by you so that together with God, we can brave these days and even find reason to praise God as we eagerly await the return of the Lord. Look at verse six. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the seas into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood, it stood firm. Here we find our first reason why God deserves our praise. Because God made this world by the power of his word. The Lord speaks, literally breathes, and the world as we know it forms. God speaks and the heavens are created. He utters a breath and the galaxies are thrown into place with the slightest sound. Mountains are formed, the rivers and the oceans are bound in their place, and humankind comes to exist. God created everything we see and everything we are. God spoke and things came to be. Just like an art piece points back to the artist, as created beings, our lives exist to give praise back to our creator. The focus of our praise is God, not what God does or does not do for us. We can praise God for being the creator. We can praise God because God made us. And Psalm 139 reminds us that you are marvelously made. Now look at verses 10 through 12. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. Here, the psalmist pivots to the next logical step. If God created everything, who has the right to rule over creation? Well, God does. Verse 11 tells us that the plans of the Lord stand firm. Or another translation says, God's plan for the world stands up. All his designs are made to last. So what are God's plans? What is God's design for the world? Great question. Let's take a quick trip back to the garden. When God's creation got messed up, God's promised plan was to restore the world and heal the image of God in humans, 
in order that we all might reign and rule with God and enjoy creation together. All the way back in the garden, we learned that God's plan was to rescue creation. So if you're here today wondering if you have messed up so badly that God has given up on you, I want to remind you that God holds your life, knows all about your life, and still chooses to pursue you because God's plans cannot be foiled. God is our rescuer, an ever-present help in trouble. Or if you're here wondering if God will really forgive you for what you have done or what you haven't done, I want to remind you that even though our personalities shift and change, the God of our salvation is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is our rock of ages, and his tender mercies have no end. Or if you're feeling scared because this world has changed so rapidly and it is exhausting and infuriating to navigate, I want to remind you that there is safety and security in God. God's plan to rescue and redeem creation has not changed. And if that's not good enough, the cherry on top is that God's loving pursuit is not just for some, it's an equal love for the whole entire world. God's plan and promise to rescue and redeem all creation is the anthem of our praise. Look at verse 13. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the heart of all, who considers everything they do. The imagery here is of the Lord sitting in the heavens, looking down on the earth. This is not giving us a geographical location, but instead is poetically communicating a position of power, reminding us that God sees all that has been created, all the inhabitants, all the things in the world, and knows what is happening in our hearts, in our minds, and behind closed doors. This concept can make my mind hurt a little bit. God seeing everything, everywhere at once. And it also invites me to rest because God is so much more and so much better than I can imagine. A quick point for three different types of people. If you are here and you feel like the Lord has not seen you, maybe you feel like you have tried to be faithful to the Lord. You have tried to live with integrity. You have tried to do acts of service and nobody sees you. You never get recognition. You feel overlooked and you wonder if it even matters. Well, Psalm 33 says, the Lord sees you. Or maybe something horrible has been done to you or to someone you know in private. It has never actually come to light and you wonder, has God actually seen? Psalm 33 says, God has seen. And to some, this might seem like a word of caution. What you do and how you live your life matters. No matter what you tell yourself to help you feel about your lifestyle, the Lord knows you and sees your life. For all you parents in the room, how often do your kids say, look, look at this, look at me? Or why do we post pictures of ourselves online? Because we want to be seen. Psalm 33 reminds us that God is a God who sees. God sees you, God sees me, God sees us. And despite what he sees, God still chooses to pursue us and be our rescuer. Because of this, we can pick up our 10 string lyres and shout our praises to the Lord. Verses 16 through 19 say, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. 
A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. As we move into our last section, we are invited to consider three images. First is that of a king, someone in a powerful posture with access to money and to power and to influence. Yet we are reminded that this won't save us. And then a warrior, one with great inner strength and a desire for good, but it's not enough to rescue him or herself either. And finally, a war horse. This was a military advancement back in the day, but even it could not overpower the Lord. Left to our own, there is nothing that can save us. No goodness, no power, no money, no control, no knowledge, no pedigree is enough. Instead, our hope is in the unfailing love of God who pursues us in order to rescue and redeem all of creation. Verse 18, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. When this poem was written thousands of years ago, there was hope for a savior. People were trusting that God would provide the promised rescuer, and they were on the lookout for the Messiah. Fortunate for us, we are sitting in a moment in time where we can look back and know that our Savior, Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, did come. God came so close that people could see him with their own eyes, hear him with their own ears, touch them with or touch him with their own hands. God put on flesh and came to us in the midst of this broken and backwards world in pursuit of us so that we can know, love, and serve God and so that God can do the same for us. But today we find ourselves in the already not yet nature of the kingdom. We have glimpses of God's power to reconcile and redeem all things, yet we live in a broken, pandemic-plagued, hurting, divided world. So how do we actually experience this oneness with God? This summer, I had the chance to participate in a prayer experience created by the writings of Ignatius, a theologian from the 1500s. Throughout this experience, the goal was to learn to recognize God in our everyday lives. The premise was this. When life throws us a real doozy and we wonder if God is really with us and we wonder how God would want us to respond, we can always look to Jesus. To be honest, I was a little skeptical. I didn't think Jesus, a Middle Eastern, unwed, nomadic man, would actually overlap that much with my everyday married, employed, mother of two life. Each day we began by either entering a story of Jesus and looking for areas of overlap or re-entering a moment of our own in order to locate Jesus in it so we could learn to find God in our midst. It was a lot like riding a bike. It was strange at first, but then it clicked. A quick story to illustrate. This past summer, we were going to have a deck built. After getting a few quotes, we went with the cheapest bid, a guy who preferred cash. So I went to the bank, withdrew cash, and met him in a parking lot to make the exchange. That's how my husband felt. That night at dinner, I told this story and my husband was speechless. He couldn't believe what I had done. He figured the guy would take the money and run. It was terribly awkward and I felt so dumb. There was no contract and I hadn't asked for a receipt. So as I was cleaning up after dinner, I got to wondering how Jesus could possibly overlap with this part of my life. And then it hit me. Jesus literally had a thief among his chosen 12. And how did Jesus treat Judas? With care and conversation. In fact, Jesus washed Judas's feet at the Last Supper. Could I possibly extend the same kind of dignity? 
The very real challenge was to lean in with care and conversation and attempt to follow Jesus' lead, relying on the power of the Spirit. The good news is that our debt guy didn't end up stiffing us. The deck is being built. But finding that overlap with Jesus helped me navigate this real life moment and recognize how to live in communion with God right here in Bend, Oregon. Around the same time, I had a really hard day and I couldn't stop the tears. Well, guess what the Bible passage was that was a sign for that day? The one where Jesus wept. From that place, Jesus begged God for strength to trust and carry on. And I tried to do the same. And when my kids drive me bonkers, or when my husband and I feel like we are not on the same page, or the money doesn't seem to quite stretch enough, or relationships are imploding, the invitation of communion is to look to Jesus and recognize God in our midst. Because we have a God who promises to never leave us nor forsake us. As the psalm suggests, our hope is grounded in the unfailing love of God, a God who created us, who holds our lives in his hands, who sees us, who has come to rescue us, and who relentlessly pursues us over and over again. Because of this, we can praise God even on the darkest night of the soul. We can sing, we can play instruments, we can even shout. We can remember what Jesus did for us as we take communion. We can get baptized and make known the goodness of our God. We can pray, we can listen, we can read the scriptures. We can look for God's image in each other. We can create space in our lives to become aware of God's interaction with us and enjoy God's presence. And as we do, we will begin to realize that we are created with a yearning for communion that no one but God can fulfill. In closing, I wanna read these last three verses of Psalm 33 and pray it over us as we long to become a people who recognize that God knows us loves us, and wants us to enjoy communion with him. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you.